What's up, everyone? This is the second part of my podcast with Ernesto Estrada. And the second part will be about drug discovery and multi-organ damage in COVID-19. Enjoy. We are, we are all living in a, in a current crisis because of COVID. And um, you did quite a lot of research um, about that. And um, yeah, I would also like to, to discuss it with you. And I thought about that we like dig into the sort of biochemistry of, of COVID in a way, and in particular in, in the context of, of your paper, which deals about um, um, multi-organ damage, which is also like incredibly interesting topic. Like even if, if you're not a fan of biochemistry or you don't understand network theory or stuff like that, because it is just we are dealing with a new virus. We don't really know what this virus is doing, not mentioning that, of course, we have learned over the past months a lot, which also then um, helps really treating people in the hospital. But nonetheless, we just like don't know what we are dealing with. And um, you have like in particular some ideas um, how to tackle the problem of uh, um, let's say multi-organ damage um, in a way with combined uh, network science and other um, disciplines and that is quite exciting. So let's start, maybe you give an overview what it is about because I think that is, that is quite, quite important. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I did a few work as you mentioned, so there are uh, mainly about the, the biology and the biochemistry of the, of the virus. Uh, now more recently about the epidemiology as well. But um, let me focus on this uh, important uh, work. And uh, it is important because uh, something that we have learned during the, the pandemic is that it is not only a respiratory disease. So it is a multi-organ and multi-system uh, kind of disease. So most of the patients that goes to intensive care units uh, and as most of the patients that uh, unfortunately pass away uh, do that because of the collateral damages produced by the virus. So what, what are these collateral damages, which at the end of the day are not collateral, are the, the most important ones, are the damage in, in about 12 or 13 different organs and systems, uh, mainly in the cardiovascular and the neurologic or also uh, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, uh, immunologic, uh, endocrine, uh, hepatic, uh, renal, etc. So uh, why I was interested in, in this, uh, first of all, because it is, it is uh, I would say, the, the most important thing uh, right now about the, the, the patient with the, with the virus, and uh, also, because we can learn about how other possible future virus uh, with uh, similar kind of pathologies uh, can be affecting uh, human health. So uh, the first thing is that uh, apparently we had uh, a couple of potential explanations for why this multi-organ uh, damage occurs during the, the, the infection with the SARS-CoV-2. So the first hypothesis is not new. Uh, the first hypothesis uh, already ar arise uh, during the SARS infection of 2002-2003, and is that uh, the virus enter directly into the other organs. So what is the reason for that? Okay, so the virus need a kind of key in the, in the human cells or in the receptor cells in order to enter into these cells. So this is the AC2 uh, uh, protein, uh, which is very abundant in the, in the human organs. And, uh, and then, of course, the virus can recognize this by its spike protein, which is how these spikes that the virus has uh, outside. Uh, it can just uh, couple to this uh, other uh, protein, human protein, enter into the organ, and then to produce the damage there. Uh, in 2004, there, there was published a paper, I could say very important paper in the biomedical literature, uh, with one single question that for me was illuminating. And uh, at that time in the autopsies that were made to uh, patients that has disease by 
uh, passed away by the, by the disease, uh, they found virus only in the lungs and in the intestine. So mm, the question was, well, if the virus is at concentration so high, which is circulating around the whole body, and if the AC2 receptor is so abundant in the whole of the organs in humans, why we don't find virus in the heart, in the brain, in the liver, in the testicles, etc. So uh, when, when I read this paper, I said, okay, there is something big here. So then the, there was an analysis in the recent years about the abundance of AC2 receptor in most of the human organs. And it was found very, very abundant in, in most of the soft uh, tissues. Uh, the lungs are not the, the most abundant in AC2 receptor. Uh, we males, for instance, has a lot in the testicles, and, uh, but they are also in the heart, are also in the, in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the first uh, alarm that sounds to me. And uh, in more recent uh, obtuses, again, uh, we have found, or pathologists have found the virus in the lungs, of course, uh, in the intestine, but not in general in other organs. There, there is debate, debate about whether there are some viral particles in the heart or not, but not in the brain, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what was the second most accepted hypothesis? The second most uh, accepted hypothesis that was in the, in the press, and uh, it was, uh, it was uh, curious because people in the street were, were talking about cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm from the biochemical point of view is very complicated, but it was very well transmitted to the population and the people learn what it means. So when the virus uh, enter into our uh, system, uh, our system uh, immunologic system respond to this uh, attack and uh, it produce uh, an arsenal of uh, chemicals to tackle uh, in different stages this, the aggression, this aggression from the virus. Some of them are cytokines, some of them are chemokines, etc. The most common one is the interleukin uh, 6. There are others as well. The immune system has an impressive ability to respond to various pathogens. Normal antiviral immune response requires the activation of the inflammatory pathways of the immune system. Cytokines are produced by immune cells that are part of the innate immune response, including macrophages, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and the adaptive T and B lymphocytes. An unchecked and over-exuberant immune response, known as a cytokine storm, can lead to irreversible tissue damage. This has been recognized in severe and critical COVID-19 patients. The cytokine storm results from a sudden acute increase in circulating levels of different pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, IL-1, TNF-alpha, and interferon, which has destructive effects on human tissue. Cytokine storm may cause acute respiratory distress syndrome, and is the major cause of death in COVID-19 patients. But one characteristic of these chemicals is that they are also pro-inflammatory. So it means that they typically produce inflammation as part of their response to this uh, virus attack. The body is supplied by oxygen via the lungs, entering the bloodstream via the alveoli to the blood vessels, and then it is distributed to the rest of the body. Complications can occur when the coronavirus settles in the space between the pulmonary alveoli and the blood vessels. That can cause inflammation. The distance to the blood vessels then becomes greater and oxygen intake is more difficult. When organs are deprived of oxygen, breathing is labored. And then respiratory muscles are quickly exhausted, especially in the elderly. That's when the lungs need help with a ventilator but that can't prevent the situation from worsening in some cases. Inflammation in the lungs increasingly hinders gas exchange. Fluid escapes from the cells. And even with the support, not enough oxygen enters the body. Then an external machine must take over the function of the lungs. 
The so-called ECMO enriches the blood outside the body with oxygen and then returns it into the body. So the major hypothesis based it also on some previous findings in uh, respiratory diseases is that uh, uh, the system was out of control, generating uh, these uh, cytokines. These cytokines produce inflammation. This inflammation produces more cytokines. And this chain reaction uh, produces uh, a, a big damage, not only in the lungs, but these cytokines can escape out of the lungs because of the permeability that has increased uh, by its damage, and then go to the other organs and produce the damage in the other organs. Okay, so far so good. But what people have done, uh, doctors in hospital, is analyzing what are the level of cytokines that patients which are having a severe uh, uh, cases of uh, COVID-19 has in their blood. And particularly, I will concentrate into interleukin-6, IL-6. And what people have found uh, since, uh, I would say, March, April uh, of this year, when the data started to emerge, is that the levels of uh, uh, interleukin-6 in this patient was between 40 to 200 times lower than what is known and what is expected in a cytokine storm. Let me put this into context. So doctors know uh, from past previous uh, respiratory diseases that when there are cytokine storms, the levels of uh, interleukin-6 is 200 times lower concentrations of the same chemical in the patients that are having severe uh, cases of COVID-19. If you go to the normal cases or non-severe normal cases, then they have levels of uh, interleukin-6 which are well below uh, any standard of uh, cytokine storm. So the most recent compilation was published in The Lancet uh, on uh, 20 of October of this year. And they analyzed a thousand of patients from different hospitals. And in all the cases, they did a meta-analysis uh, finding that the levels of uh, cytokine uh, in general and interleukin-6 in particular are very, very well below the levels which are observed in uh, patients with severe damage of the, of the lungs. And Nesto is referring to this high-level paper which appeared in The Lancet in print form in December 2020 and in online form in October 2020. And it's a meta-study about many other studies uh, which are uh, evaluated. And the key finding is um, quote, our findings question the role of cytokine storm in COVID-19 induced organ dysfunction. So again, here what we have are two simple, two clear solutions to a complex problem, which are not necessarily right. I'm not saying there are no patients in which the damage is produced because of the uh, cytokine storm. Yeah but not all, this is not the universal explanation as it was claimed in the literature. And we have as scientists to adapt to these new paradigms of complex systems. There are no simple explanation to complex systems. This disease is a complex disease acting in a complex system, which is a human body which contain many complex systems like metabolic networks, like protein interaction network, like trinitrectomic networks, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we expect a simple and clear explanation? Mm -hmm. Well, this was the science of the 20th century. Okay, so particles interacting this way and we have the neutrino and everybody was happy. But now we are in a, in a completely different level. Social problems are no simple problems. These biological problems are no simple problems. Ecological problems are no simple problems. Okay, so in this context, I, I, study, I started to collect information. And uh, what I knew before, well, I knew what is the new paradigm in, uh, for explaining diseases in general. So we have a network of proteins which are interacting to each other in our body. So we have about 10,000 different proteins or 
more or less. So uh, what we know is that if we damage one of these proteins, this damage can cascade into uh, the rest of the protein interaction network, and, uh, and this can produce uh, a disease, particularly if this damage uh, cannot be repaired by our organism. Let me put this into a context. Okay, so here what we have is a network in which every single node of the network is a protein. And then two of these proteins are connected in the network if and only if there is experimental evidence that they are interacting inside the cell for producing some kind of action. Mm -hmm. So let me say something. Yes, please. Yeah, just like, um, so you have two nodes, which are two proteins, um, and there's an interaction, but this, this does not have, the interaction does not have to take place necessarily in a single cell. So it could be two separate organs, let's say, the, the heart and, and the lung or whatever. And over the uh, vascular system, then those proteins are transported or maybe transported, could be also other processes. And that is also um, how they sort of talk to each other. So that is also like, it's a, it's a global, it's a holistic global um, interaction. And um, as everyone knows, I think the simplest example would be uh, hormones. Obviously they are produced at one place to have some reaction at another place. For example, the heart is then um, beating a little bit faster. The endocrine system works constantly to orchestrate these changes. Alongside growth and sexual maturity, this system regulates everything from your sleep to the rhythm of your beating heart, exerting its influence over each and every one of your cells. The endocrine system relies on interactions between three features to do its job, glands, hormones, and trillions of cell receptors. Firstly, there are several hormone-producing glands, three in your brain and seven in the rest of your body. Each is surrounded by a network of blood vessels, from which they extract ingredients to manufacture dozens of hormones. Those hormones are then pumped out in tiny amounts, usually into the bloodstream. Indeed, I made a mistake of uh, the first uh, steps of this research. I, I didn't consider these, that the, the, the proteins that could be affected directly by the virus in the lungs interact with other proteins. In the network, they are connected, but they are physically well apart from each other. And uh, this was uh, a major bottleneck for my, for my theory, and it was how these proteins can communicate to each other. So what is known, uh, uh, it's not a new concept, but has been found uh, very strong support in the experimental support in the last few years, is the existence of something which are named extracellular vesicles. The way in which cells function and communicate is not fully understood. One area of cell function which has only recently been appreciated is the role of extracellular vesicles, or EVs. EVs are vesicles carrying cargo, which are released by cells, and it turns out they have many important roles. They can be formed in various ways. Look to your right. Microvesicles are a type of EV formed when the plasma membrane buds outwardly until it pinches off, with its cargo loaded into the microvesicle as it forms. Plasma membrane-derived EVs other than microvesicles are also formed, such as apoptotic bodies and large oncosomes. Another type of EV is called an exosome. The plasma membrane buds inwardly, forming intracellular vesicles, carrying material from the cell surface and the extracellular space. These vesicles then fuse with the early endosome. The early endosome moves along microtubule tracks, and as they mature, various proteins, including the escort complexes and accessory proteins, bind to the surface. The membrane curves inwardly, leading to the formation of intraluminal vesicles with various types of cargo sorted into them as they form. This structure becomes known as a multivesicular body, or MVB. The MVB is then trafficked to the cell surface along microtubules. When the MVB fuses with the plasma membrane, it leads to the release of the intraluminal vesicles, which are then known as exosomes. And uh, extracellular vesicles, there are of different kinds, I will simply mention uh, two of them or, or three, uh, are simple kind of spheres uh, that contain inside, well, these spheres are made by proteins, like lipids, for instance. They, they are some kind of fat spheres, and uh, they are of very tiny 
uh, dimensions uh, of, the, of the size of microns, but they can transport in normal conditions in the body, uh, micro uh, RNA uh, proteins and uh, lipids from one organ to another organ. Why did the organism do this? This is the way in which the organs cross talk. So if the lungs need to, to say that the, the, you are doing that, you are exercising, okay, uh, in the bike. So of course, the, 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 the respiration uh, needs more oxygen and then uh, this needs to be uh, uh, bombed by the, by, the, by the heart. So the lungs send some information to the heart and the heart responds and, and so forth. So there is this kind of normal communication and experimentalists, biologists, have found thousands of different exosomes, which are kind of uh, uh, extracellular vesicle, in the communication between different kind of organs. Many types of sophisticated therapies are either too fragile or too big to get into cells, and not easily targeted to specific sites of disease. To address these challenges, Evox uses the body's own natural delivery and messaging system, the exosome. Exosomes are small, extracellular vesicles that can stably transport cargo between cells across great distances. Scientists at Evox are able to pack exosomes safely with all kinds of delicate but effective treatments. In order for the exosomes to deliver these drugs with accuracy, they need to find the sites of disease in the body. Evox scientists can cover the outside of exosomes with targeting molecules. This means that Evox exosomes can get to their destination more easily and even cross tissue barriers like the blood-brain barrier, which is a big hindrance in delivering drugs to the brain. The exosomes then bind to their target cells and get internalized. Inside the cell, specialized cell machinery delivers the drug cargo and helps treat the disease. So now we have two ingredients here. The first ingredient is the protein-protein interaction network of the humans, about 10,000 proteins. The second ingredient is that the way in which uh, one protein can uh, be transported from one organ to the other. And then there was a third ingredient that appears in March, uh, April of uh, this year, that was the determination of all the proteins that were targeted by the uh, viral proteins when the virus enter in the, uh, in the lungs. Okay, so the virus has only 29 proteins. So this tiny virus enter into the lungs, it opens the capsule, the viral capsule, and then it spread there uh, these 29 different proteins and the RNA. So all of these proteins has some kind of a specialized activity. We don't know exactly what kind of activities mm -hmm. all of them. Uh, yeah. but, yes. Yeah. So probably, so the, you said 29, right? So some, one part or one combination of proteins are probably responsible to build, uh, to initiate in the cell certain responses. Well, we know the, the whole cycle of the virus. So I, I will not extend very much, but the, the, we know uh, when the virus uh, just uh, before entering the cell, how it coupled with the spike uh, proteins to the AC2, that uh, it need a catalyzer, then it enter, then it open the, the capsule and uh, put the RNA, how they sequester, uh, because they, they don't have uh, any ribosome. So they sequester our uh, ribosome to produce their own DNA. And uh, then what they, they do is that they transform this RNA into two big, uh, polyproteins and these two big polyproteins need to be cut and they are cut by the protease. So the protease is one of the proteins that are already inside the virus. So it has a very specific uh, kind of uh, function. Uh, there we have many other proteins with very specific kind of function. But now there is the following. So these proteins interact with human proteins. Are these interaction accidental? or was the virus evolving somehow to affect tackling some of these proteins? I don't know. So I don't know, and I, I don't think anybody right now knows.
So uh, from time to time, uh, it, it appears something that we say, oh, what, what is this protein doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see any function, but it interacts with this human protein. So probably it, it needs uh, to do this kind of function. But what we know is the capacity, and this is, this is different because uh, these uh, this are done in experiments. So we know the capacity of all these 29 proteins to interact with uh, about 300 of these proteins that human has. So from these 10,000 proteins that we have, the virus interact or may interact with about 300 of these proteins. Now, the first uh, thing that was really remarkable uh, was discovered by the group of Barabachi. They, they analyzed the whole network of uh, interactions of the, of the human protein protein interactions, and they discovered that these 300 uh, 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 proteins that the virus tackle are not randomly spread across the, the, the protein protein interaction network of humans. They are all interconnected. So they are localized in one region. Uh, why? We don't know. But this is, this is a, a kind of curiosity. If you ask uh, from a completely mathematical perspective, the probability that this happened could be very close to zero. So in a completely random way. So, but anyway, so we know that, that these uh, 29 proteins uh, are target or may target uh, about these 300 uh, uh, human proteins. So we can now, and this is what I did, investigate these 300 proteins that may be tackled by, by the virus. And one of the things is to consider what is the abundance of these proteins in the different organs. So this is just to uh, do a bioinformatic analysis, which of these 300 proteins are really highly expressed in the lungs. So we found a few of these proteins which are highly expressed in the lungs. So there is, from probabilistic point of view, a high probability that these proteins be targeted directly, accidentally, or because they are uh, uh, the goal of these uh, virus proteins, but they may be targeted by viral uh, uh, proteins. And then we have other proteins which are mainly expressed in the heart, mainly expressed in the neurological system or in the gastrointestinal system, etc. But now we went a little bit further and considered from which, which of these proteins are vulnerable proteins. What it means by vulnerable proteins? Well, a vulnerable protein is a protein which is expressed in one of these organs outside the lungs and which is damaged, produce a failure in this organ or system. And this is known from previous knowledge in uh, the biology of these uh, proteins. So let me put one simple example. Suppose that there is a protein, let me call A, that I discovered that this protein is one of the proteins tackled by the virus, but it's mainly expressed in the heart. And a few years ago, investigators determined that the damage in this protein produced a heart attack. So this protein is for us a vulnerable protein because mm -hmm. if it is damaged, it can produce a damage in the heart or in any other organ. Now we have this category of proteins, but we need another category of proteins. We need the category of perturbators. And these perturbators are those proteins which are mainly expressed in the lungs and which are targeted directly by the virus, but that they can travel from the lungs to the heart or from the lung to any other organ. And how do we determine that? By using uh, bioinformatic tools and determining whether this protein has been found in extracellular vesicles traveling through the body uh, uh, in some way. So then we have two categories of proteins. One of them are perturbators. The other are the vulnerable proteins. And the perturbators are mainly in the lungs. They can travel outside the lungs and affect uh, the proteins in the organs. So now let me put this into a context. How these 
complicated machinery uh, may work. Well, first of all, the virus enter into the lungs and open the capsule, and then the viral proteins enter into the uh, lung cell. Let's say that one of the proteins in the lungs is affected by one of these viral proteins. What I mean by affected? Well, if there is an interaction, this is a physical interaction. It can be simply a change in the conformation. It can be that uh, a new piece can be attached, chemically bounded to the protein. And then this protein can enter into a vesicle which is in the lung, which is forming for going in normal conditions to the heart, for instance. Then this vesicle is like a taxi. It is allowing to enter the typical proteins that goes inside this taxi and the typical micro RNA, the typical lipids, etc. But now the permeability of the lungs has also increased because the lung has suffering a damage produced by the, uh, by the proper virus activity. So there are many of these uh, extracellular vesicles going out the lungs. So now this extracellular vesicle, this taxi, goes to the lung, to, sorry, to the, to the heart. And the heart needs to recognize that this is a good taxi to leave it to enter into the heart but the extracellular vesicle don't have any damage. It is perfect. So the heart opens the door to the cell and this extracellular vesicle enter the heart. What it do is that what it simply does in normal conditions, open the doors and the micro RNA and the proteins go out. But now the protein A that is going out from the lungs, oh, sorry, is coming from the lungs and is entering into the heart is damaged. And this protein has to interact with this protein B that we have identified as a vulnerable protein. And then when it tried to do this connection, this protein A is damaged. So now it cannot be fixed in the interaction with the protein B, and the protein B cannot uh, produce its normal function. It's like if protein B is now damaged as a collateral effect of the damage of the perturbator. So this perturbator is perturbing the protein in the heart. And we know that a perturbation in this protein B produces a heart attack. So what happened is that this patient will have a heart attack as a consequence of the virus damaging the uh, perturbator in the lungs. Mm -hmm. We don't discard, we didn't discard the case that the protein A travel together with the viral protein if the, if the bond between the two proteins, the protein A in the lungs and the viral protein is too strong, it can enter together into the taxi. So when they disembark it in the, in the heart, you will have viral proteins also in the heart. So you can observe also viral proteins in different organs by using this mechanism. Mm -hmm. So why this, uh, what this mechanism explains? So there is a, a few mathematical things that I have skipped here because uh, the way in which this navigation occurs need to be described by certain kind of equations. You mentioned at the, at the very beginning the fractionary calculus. Well, here we use directly fractional calculus. And why fractional calculus? Because the diffusion in these organs, in typically the cell, if you take any, any book, uh, of cellular biology, or even when, when you are in the, in the school and then you open a book and you see the cell, oh my God, the cell looks so simple in this picture. Oh, you have the nuclei, you have a three. No, this is completely wrong. We have 42 million proteins inside the cell. Mm -hmm. We have millions of uh, uh, lipids, a million of molecules. So it's a very crowded environment. So in order to navigate, inside this crowded uh, uh, scenario, uh, the motion is very difficult. And this produces a kind of subdiffusive motion, which is exactly saying that 
the territory that you can uh, navigate is much lower than you would expect if there were no this so crowded environment. And to describe this mathematically, you can do it by a fractional temporal differential equation. So it means that you have a sort of waiting time, which is described by this fractional uh, 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 derivative that we mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this mathematical, yes, please. Uh, one, one, okay, so that, that was, so I, before you go on with the mathematics, which is um, very interesting, I just like want to uh, clarify one, one thing in, in case I, I correctly understood it. So meaning, so obviously this, this bad interaction, which then eventually uh, leads to uh, appearance of, let's say, damaged proteins in the heart, which are known for causing, for example, or related or correlated with, uh, with heart attack, that is not an on-off thing. So for example, if you have like certain, there's a de degree which to which these, uh, these taxis go from the lung to the heart, and obviously there are a lot of correct, a lot of non-damaged uh, proteins in the heart. And it's not like if, let's say, one vehicle arrives, then you will get a heart attack. So it's something between it can be very bad, in particular if this uh, storm is just like uh, really blowing a lot and producing a lot of the stuff, which then, in a way, according to your hypothesis, um, produces these proteins. So then if it's like too much, that can contribute substantially to the probability to get like, for example, heart disease. Yeah, absolutely. So you are right. So all of these processes are probabilistic processes. It's the same like uh, when people talk about the, the epidemiology of the street. So I mean, uh, people in the street talking about, and, uh, and then of course it depends. So the, the vital charge that the, the person uh, is exposed to, because it's the same like, uh, Okay, so I have an umbrella here and, uh, and you are uh, throwing me stones. So if you throw me one stone, I can just simply skip it with my umbrella. If you throw me 100 stones, so maybe you break my umbrella and some of the stones hit me. So what happened is that in the severe cases of, uh, of the COVID-19, what happened is that the permeability of the lungs increased very much possibly because of cytokines, possibly because of the direct damage of the, of the virus, etc. So the charge of these uh, perturbators that can go to the different organs is much higher. And then the probability is like a throwing 100 stones instead of one stone only. For instance, in the paper, which will appear definitely after a long time in uh, medicine, in, um, in drug discovery, uh, on the 27th of this month, uh, we added a, a note uh, in press because on the 2nd of October of this year, it was reported in the Lancet, the first case in which a patient that has suffered severe COVID uh, after recover uh, started to uh, have a Parkinson's disease. What happened is that in our paper, we identified one vulnerable protein that is expressed mainly in the neurological system and it is related to it is vulnerable because it's related to parkinson disease and to movement disorders and then we found that this protein can be directly perturbed by some proteins uh, which are damaged by the virus in the lungs uh, 70 percent of those that has uh, suffered some some uh, symptoms uh, in four months uh, refer a damage in at least one organ, 70%. So this is a high percentage. So we did this report on the long-term effects of COVID-19 based on a request from the Department of Health. And we searched the published literature for long-term effects, both preprint and peer-reviewed articles. And the pandemic is new, so there's not a whole lot known at this point, but what we found was that even a couple of months after hospitalization, many patients with COVID-19 are still experiencing fatigue, shortness of breath, sometimes problems with their memory or difficulty concentrating. And even some patients who don't require hospitalization for COVID-19 are still having cough, 
um, and fatigue several weeks after their illness. Um, I've been very lucky that unlike lots of people in our support group, my doctor believed me from the beginning. A lot of people were told it was all in their heads, that it was anxiety related to lockdown and goodness knows what that were causing these incredibly debilitating symptoms. Um, but unfortunately, my doctor and those I've seen at the hospital don't know what to do with me. So we don't know even if this new disease that we're talking about is um, a six month story, a six year story or a lifelong story. But whatever it is, um, it would be really helpful if we could spot it earlier and do something to prevent it. Whenever we thought we were confident and had it sorted, you remember at the beginning, people used to say, oh, it's a bit like flu, we'll just treat it like flu. Every time, or you, know, you can say, well, it's, a, it's nearest neighbor are the common cold viruses. We'll, keep, we'll treat it as a, as a neighbor of the common cold. And every time we had assumptions, um, we were found to be wildly wrong and had to rewrite the textbook. And so, and so it goes on. Mm -hmm. And all of this can be explained by the proper mechanism in the follow-up uh, of these uh, 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 encapsulated uh, damaged proteins in the different organs. What, what is important is that we have a mechanism and that this mechanism is universal. Well, we are not claiming that. We are claiming that it is part of the, of the problem possibly together with the other ones and possibly with others. But this mechanism also allow us to uh, identify drugs that are able to tackle this multi-organ damage. Why? Because we are talking about proteins and these proteins are already known, some of them are already known to be uh, the target of certain kind of drugs for uh, damage in the heart or neurological damages or uh, musculoskeletal damage, et cetera, et cetera. So we identify all the drugs existing in the literature that are able to interact with any of these proteins, even the vulnerable proteins or the perturbators. So it means that we are trying to tackle the problem at the origin by uh, let's say inhibiting the perturbators and avoiding that they go to the to the organ and produce the damage or if this is not the case well we can act directly over the vulnerable protein protein and protect it from the perturbator so we identify at the beginning not very much to be honest but 27 drugs and we were very excited until we discovered that some of these drugs can produce uh, interaction between them in the organism and then exacerbate the damage that one of the proteins, uh, sorry, that one of the drugs can produce uh, alone. So then we simply eliminate all these drugs that can have uh, interaction between them. And uh, there were remaining eight drugs that can be combined in different ways in order to uh, tackle the, the damage in the different organs. What do you mean with you, you, you got rid of these ones which have interaction, you mean negative interaction or which will cause to side effects? Yeah. Or you, mean that so or? You, you know that uh, sometimes uh, if you take a one medication and you yeah. take a, another medication, so the combination of the two can produce... Incompatible, uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Secondary effect. Mm -hmm. So we eliminate all of these potential secondary effects. And then the only uh, drugs which were clean of known secondary effects in the combination were these eight. Well, there are seven drugs and one natural product. Mm -hmm. And um, so all of these seven drugs are known. So they are in clinics. Some of them are used for heart problems. Some of them are used for neurological problems, etc. But what we have discovered is that there is not any single magic bullet. So there is no one single drug that can palliate the damage in the 13 organs of systems. Of course, this is, this is well expected, but there is a minimum. So there is, a, as mathematicians say, uh, an, a lower bound. So the lower bound here is four drugs. So combination of four drugs is always necessary for tackling all of these damages, of course. It's very rare that you will have a patient with damage in all the organs. So typically you have combination of two organs or three organs, and then we have produced a new kind of, uh, let's say, orienting network in which you have the organs that could be damaged, 
and which drug you should use if this combination is the two which are damaged. If there are three, you have possibly another combination. If there are four, another combination, and so forth. So this is in order to help, uh, because we are proposing this for clinical trials, and uh, is for helping in navigating this very complicated scenario in which different organs can be, can be damaged. So uh, we hope that uh, uh, this, this will be finally published uh, this Friday, so then, then uh, that people pay attention to this uh, in the literature. We know that proteins that are being produced in one part of the body, let's say an organ, um, are being transported to another part of the body, let's say another organ, let's say from liver to heart. So now the hypothesis of uh, Ernesto is the following. So the reproduction process generates damaged proteins at one place, in particular in the lung, and then they are being transported to other organs, to many other organs. And then they may cause like a short-term or long-term damage, depending on the concentration of these damaged proteins. Of course, there are always proteins which are not damaged, but the concentration of, of these damaged proteins may cause um, mild or severe effects. So that is um, the paper uh, by Ernesto, which appeared in Medicine and Drug Discovery. And it's called Protein-Driven Mechanism of Multi-Organ Damage in COVID-19. So let us scroll to the figure one, which explains the main mechanism. Here it is. So COVID-19 starts to cause problems in the lung. And um, the hypothesis of uh, Ernesto is that um, there will be a production of um, damaged proteins, which then make it through a transport over these, using these exosomes to other organs here. So, and then there's a protein-protein interaction and these damaged, or he called it perturbed proteins, they interact with other proteins and sort of also damage them. And that leads to problems. And the description, the dynamical description of this interaction involves subdiffusion. And that we have sort of partially discussed in the part one of the podcast. Well, so the, the damaged proteins damage sort of other proteins, which causes problem in other organs. That is the main mechanism in this figure here. That is his hypothesis. But he doesn't stop there. If you scroll down here, um, he actually suggests by using bioinformatics and data, which combination of drugs can be applied um, to uh, palliate um, organs. So the organs which are then damaged indirectly by COVID through this process where it starts in the lung and then it, it moves to other organs. And uh, depending on which organs are affected, which definitely depends on the patient, and then you can apply um, certain combinations of drugs. And as he explained, he focused more or less on, on seven existing drugs which can be repurposed. So from the mathematical standpoint, the subdiffusion to, to give you the link to the part one involves um, yeah, fractional diffusion, if you want. Here's the so-called mean square displacement, which is sort of the square of the diameter I was talking about. And the time is raised to a power of some exponent. And um, also this fractional um, derivative here appears, and that is needed to, to, um, to, to model the protein-protein interaction. That means it is an extremely impressive um, hypothesis, an extremely impressive work, which combines really a variety of different methods from bioinformatics, network theory, anomalous diffusion, um, and other methods. Um, it is um, data-driven and uh, obviously evidence-based and um, yeah, based on, on already 
known interactions between proteins and also positive and negative interactions between drugs. This figure here shows that not all proteins are vulnerable. Only these proteins here on the left-hand side are vulnerable, and not all proteins will perturb the vulnerable proteins. These will be here the, uh, the proteins in the middle. And that is sort of a selection from all other possible proteins here, which are so many that you cannot really see it. This figure here shows the undesired interaction between a pair of two drugs. If there's a link between them here, then there's an undesired interaction known from the literature. So Ernesto is not suggesting that someone should take a combination of drugs, um, but it's a proposal, this paper, for a clinical study, which has to be performed and evaluated. So that is a basic mechanism, that is basic research, and the hypothesis is based on in a nutshell, on bioinformatics, not on any clinical trial, any clinical study which has been performed. So obviously, that is for medical doctors to read and to evaluate and to think about it. You mentioned uh, this um, one also work of you related also to COVID about the protease, so which is like specific, uh, I think it was about the um, how it's shaped in, 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 in space and how it relates, does it relate to COVID, this, this uh, research? Yes, it is, it is, it is. Uh, if, you, if you still have energy to talk, I, so yeah, why not go, yeah, perfect, okay. This paper, and uh, yes, well, I, I, I knew that the protease was an old friend of mine. <laughs> so uh, many virus has protease. Uh, the, I, I use it to say to the students that the protease is like a digestive uh, uh, system of the virus because mm -hmm. it, it, it take uh, these polyproteins and split into different proteins. So uh, there was a qualitative jump uh, uh, during the HIV uh, infection and treatment mm -hmm. when the HIV protease was discovered in the 1990s and, uh, and inhibitors of these uh, protease were designed. HIV protease is needed at the last steps of the viral life cycle to cut the HIV polyprotein into its individual functional parts. So it was really represented a, a jump in the quality of life of uh, HIV patients. So I was uh, working at that time trying to design, and indeed we designed some antiviral, uh, anti-HIV uh, protease uh, drugs uh, with people at the University of Santiago de Compostela here in Spain. So I, I knew the protease. So when I when I, I knew about the, the the new virus, the first thing I, I tried to find was was the the protease crystallized. Uh, it's already available, and in March of this year, uh, a group of uh, crystallographers uh, crystallized the protease and crystallized the protease with some inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the paper was published in Nature and. Uh, then when, when you read the, 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 the introductory part of the paper, it's very surprising because they compare this protease with the protease of the uh, SARS virus of 2002-2003. And uh, what you see is, well, the, the, the proteins, you can write the primary um, structure of the protein as a very long word. So every single amino acid is one letter, and then uh, you have a very long war. In this case, it's about 300 letters, and every letter in a specific position is one amino acid in this particular position. So if you put the war for the SARS, for the protease of the SARS of 2002 and 2019, you see that the two words are almost exactly the same, except in 12 letters. So there are 12 letters in different positions that has been changed. But now 12 letters in 300, you can take the, the percentage is very small. If you take the three dimensional structure of both protease and you superpose to each other uh, and minimize the, the, the error in the superposition, uh, this error is about uh, 0.53 angstrom. So it's, they are almost identical. 
So this was very disappointing because I was expecting something different. So this virus is much more aggressive and I was uh, expecting that this were reflected somehow in the structure of the proteins. But you know, we as researchers uh, uh, can never surrender. And uh, the first thing is, okay, maybe we are seeing too much. So if you see the forest and you, you try to see a squirrel, squirrel there, uh, maybe you, you cannot see it because there are many, many things. But if you simply concentrate, let's say, into the trunks of the, of the trees, maybe you are able to uh, visualize the squirrel. So the first thing that I did is, well, let me represent these proteases as a network. And uh, here we have a different kind of network. And this network, every amino acid is one node of the network. And then two amino acids or two nodes are connected. If these two corresponding amino acids are separated at less than seven angstrom. And why seven angstrom? Because this is the distance in which we know that two uh, molecules can interact with each other. So it could be hydrophobic interaction, electrostatic interaction, any kind of interaction between the two regions. So what it means, it means to reduce the information from the atomic level in which we have thousands of atoms to only 300 nodes, which are my amino acids of the corresponding protease. So now I have several versions because there has been many different crystallizations, in different conditions for the protease of the SARS of 2002. I will call SARS-CoV-1 and the one of the SARS-CoV-2. And uh, well, after cleaning all the data, things that uh, sometimes you are surprised because in the crystal there are pieces of the, of the protein that are not there because of errors and things like that. After cleaning everything, I compared the networks. And what I did, what I obtained was not surprising. The difference between the networks in the, let's say, classical, kind of network measures. And for network scientists, this means, let's say the average path lens, the average clustering coefficient, uh, modularity, blah, blah, blah. So the difference was never bigger than 2%. So they were almost identical. And uh, after all of this disappointing uh, stuff, I remember a work I published a few years ago with uh, uh, one of my students, and it was a completely mathematically oriented kind of, uh, of paper, and it was published in the mathematics literature. And the, the, the goal of this paper was to investigate long range transmission in networks. Okay, so if I have a network and I have a perturbation of one particular node, this perturbation can spread across the network, but it could be felt mainly just in the neighborhood, okay? So if I open the window here and I cry, so only my neighbors will listen my cry. But now suppose that there is some kind of strange, and that's, that's the funny thing of mathematics. I can imagine some kind of a strange uh, scenario in which I cry here, and my neighbors doesn't listen very well what I was saying, but people a kilometer from here listen clearly what I was saying. It is amplified with distance. It's a long range amplification. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, let me try with this mathematical tool. And then what I discover is that the new protease increases this sensibility to transmit information a long range distance in a 1,900% respect to the protease of the 2002. So let me put in plain words. Suppose that you have uh, a spider web, okay? Mm -hmm. You have a spider web and uh, you are a spider, but you are a little bit lazy spider. So then uh, if you are a lazy spider, and you go to the spider's pub and drink a spider's beer, what happens is that sometimes the prey that enter into your spider web produce some vibrations, but you are in the pub. You, you, don't, you don't listen to that, so the, the prey can escape. And then when you return, you see that 
your spider web is broken, but you don't have any prey there. Very disappointing. But now suppose that you are a lazy but clever spider and you design a web which is very sensitive to transmit perturbations at relatively long range. So it means that you are in a pub, drinking your spider beer, then the prey enter into the spider web and a ring immediately bell in the pub. You went out, take the prey, eat and finish your beer. This is exactly what the protease of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 has done. Remember, the protease has the job of uh, producing the digestion of the, of the virus. So it has to cut all of these proteins, but it has to be aware of the environment. It enter into a new environment, which is the human cell. It, it could be perturbed in some ways and, and advice. This polyprotein has been already produced, etc. So this can be interpreted as an increase in almost 2,000% of the efficiency of this protease in doing its job. This was very disappointing from the point of view of the damage that the protease was doing, of course, because we want to kill the virus. So I investigated was what was the most sensitive region of the uh, protease to these long range perturbations. Of course, what you expect is that this is produced in the catalytic site, because the catalytic site is the site designed or evolved for producing the action, the enzymatic action of this protease. So the SARS-CoV-2 evolved to have a large sensitivity around this catalytic site to transmit this information across the whole protease and uh, perform its enzymatic activity at a very high level. And here is the problem for the virus. It improved, but the catalytic site is also the binding site for the strongest inhibitors. So we human has discovered that the uh, inhibitors also go to the catalytic site, possibly avoiding the catalytic activity of the protease and then impeding the digestion of the, of the virus and uh, finally killing the virus. So now from the catalytic, sorry, from the inhibitor point of view, what you have to do is to design inhibitors that produce stronger long range perturbations in the protease. And we found how to do this, and this is just the, the recommendations in, in this paper, is uh, that these uh, inhibitors that produce this perturbation, it, it is now acting again with the spider web and, and this analogy is like, okay, now the insect goes to uh, the spider web, but not enter into the spider web. It simply throw a missile to the spider web. So because the spider web is so sensitive, the spider went out. But now the site for eating in the, in the spider web is blocked by this missile. So then it means that now the spider can die. And this is what happened to the virus in the presence of this inhibitor. So basically the, the, the work has two important or three important things. The first is that the, the uh, network simplification in the representation of the protein uh, bring a lot of information, which is very surprising. Uh, the second is that the uh, new protease, and now we are investigating other proteins in order to see if this is also manifested in the rest of the proteome of the, of the SARS-CoV-2, uh, increases uh, its effectivity or efficiency in almost 2,000%. And the third message is that you can use this uh, hyper-efficiency in order to design uh, inhibitors that kill the, the virus. So this, this work uh, that was published in CHAOS uh, appear in, appears in the, 
in the podcast of the of the journal and also in the press. So there was a very good uh, coverage, media coverage of that particular paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. So yeah, very, very um, impressive. Um, yeah, so I think we are sort of done. Let me think. So I will obviously cut that oh, off. Oh. But, uh, we have been three hours. In the third part, we will talk about social balance and social imbalance, how to quantify conflicts and how to predict wars.